Hi everyone, welcome to the final webinar in our QC webinar series. The final topic is on improving color quality control by problem solving. Once again, Tim Mao is presenting, our Applications Engineering and Technical Support Manager at XY Pantone. I'm Robert Grotanz, a Global Technical Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. If at any time during Tim's presentation you have any questions, please feel free to submit them using the questions form. We will provide some additional time at the end to allow you to type up your questions, and we will do our best to follow up with you as soon as possible. We will also send out a link to a recording to this webinar tomorrow so that you can watch it again. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim to get things started. Thank you, Robert, and welcome, everyone. Um, you may see I'm, the title of my uh, slide here is a slightly different than what Robert said, but um, you know I'm ta I, I titled it Tips for Efficient Color Adjustment. Um, it's been called Tips for Efficient Color Matching. We've used a number of different names, but the reality is really that question in the middle. My color is wrong, now what do I do? Um, in this series, this is, this is um, webinar number five of a, of a QC series. We've talked about, uh, about establishing standards and and knowing whether my color is good or not good, but we wanna to talk today about what do I do when it isn't good? Because just telling you color is bad isn't enough. We have to, we wanna help you um, get to how you make bad color good. So what do I do? So we're gonna start, this is gonna be a bit of a review if you've been through the series from our last one, um, talk real quick about tolerancing. We talk about we gotta make our tolerance actionable, right? And by saying that what we're talking about is you know, that, that we be able to do something when we fail, um, make it give me some action. We need to understand that the difference between good color and bad color is not a knife edge. Again, this is a review if you've been through the series. So we have a series of samples here, um, 15 of them that are pass or fail. Um, and the, the point of this tolerancing slide was to say, let's set our tolerance to alert us when color is starting to drift toward failure. Because one of the things we want to do, one of the pr thing, problems we need to solve is, is, is um, or focus on is being able to solve the problem before it becomes a problem. Um, can we anticipate when we're going to have a problem? And that's what this does, right? By setting a tolerance with a margin so that I get some samples like the first two there, or the second one down, for example, with a 0.83 DECMC, if my tolerance is one, Hey, when I get samples in the 0.83 to 0.9 range, 0.99, um, I want to be aware of those because those are so close to failing. I want to be aware of them so I can start to take action before they fail. If I'm doing um, repeated testing throughout the run, throughout a production run, um, I want to know when things are starting to get bad so that I can start to take some action. So that's why I wanted to bring this tolerance piece back up. Um, and then obviously we need to use our color space delta values for what do we fix? Is it too light or too dark, too red, too green, too blue, too yellow, and so on. So let's talk a little more about that. So our tolerance, let's assume now our tolerance has told us that we've either, we're in the margin and we're close to failing or we've already gotten a failed color. So how do I go about adjusting that? Well, it's entirely product and process dependent. Depends what it is you're doing, right? What it is you're measuring. Um, and in some cases, there's nothing you can do. Um, people who are measuring natural um, items like marble or wood, there may be nothing you can do if you're going to live with a natural substance. You can't change its color. Um, and so you might be just using it for sorting. But you, if you're making something that you do have some control of, then there's some things we can do. It can be as easy as tinning a batch of paint or a bucket of ink, right? Just add something to it. We might be able to just change its color. It's still in a unfinished form, if you will. But I could also be in this world where it's as difficult as I'm gonna have to scrap the entire production run, recycle it, and start over. I might be making something molded of plastic. By the time it's molded, it's too late. I can't change it anymore. But there are times when we do QC and find out that the color is not acceptable at that point. The final product has already been created. It's too late to fix it 
like the easy solution above doesn't mean I can't do anything, right? I might be able to um, rework it, redo it, recycle it. I might have to start over. But all of these, whether it's the easy way or the hard way, begin with us identifying what's wrong. And they typically will fall into two groups, and we're going to talk about these two specific groups. The colorant mix, meaning the things that were mixed together to produce that color, whether it's in um, pigments going into a plastic um, master batch, whether it's um, colorants that are dispensed into a gallon or a, um, a vat of paint, whether it's dyes that are mixed together to dye a piece of fabric, um, whatever colorant, maybe I didn't get the mixture quite right, or the mixture is just a little off and I need to adjust that. That's one area. The other area we're going to look at is process variables, things in the process that are causing the color to change. The mix is correct, but something we're doing during processing might be causing it. So in either case, we're going to start by looking at things like this, right? So here, for as an example, we have a pale yellow standard. I've got 10 trials. You'll see I have some pass, some fail. Um, the failed ones, some of them are light, some of them are dark, um, some of them are too red, some of them are, are uh, well, it looks like actually all the failed ones are, probably, I don't know, one's a little too green, they're too yellow, they're too blue. They vary in why, right? And we can't just simply look at that and know whether it's a colorant problem or a process problem. So let's dive in a little deeper. Let's assume now we're going to deal with something where we have a colorant problem. So how do I fix that? Well, I'm either going to use my own expertise, if I'm a a, a seasoned color matcher and I've made this color before, I probably know what to do without any help. Or maybe I'm going to use something like iMatch software to correct the color. So in this case, we're dealing with this. We have this color called Koi Pink. Okay? Um, the delta E on that's 8.36. Obviously, it's a problem. It's basically seven units too light, 10 units too green, and four units too blue. So I look at that and go, okay, um, if I'm an experienced color matcher, especially if I've mixed this color before, I probably already know what's in it, and I know I need to add a little of this or add a little of that um, to fix it, right? I need to make it redder, I need to make it yellower, and I need to make it darker, okay? And I might know how to do that. Um, an experienced color matcher, somebody who's really good at what they do, can do this very, very quickly. They, they're relying on their brain and the history of knowledge they have about color matching. Um, but we can also do it with software. So here's what that exact color looks like if we were using it um, in iMatch and doing a correction to it. And we'll highlight a few things, right? So first, we're going to fix the A, right? So we're adding. Um, way over on the right-hand side there, you can see the add amount. We're going to add 7.9 units, whatever it is, grams, pounds, doesn't, doesn't really, the units doesn't really matter. But it's going to add a bunch of red. Why? Because it was 10 units to green. We're going to redden the color. Okay, so that'll fix the A part of it. And we're going to fix the B part of it where it's off. It was too blue. So what are we doing? We're adding yellow. Okay, so we're adding yellow and red to fix it from being too green and too blue. Totally makes sense. Now, what are we going to do about the fact that it's too light? We're adding white. Well, that might not make a whole lot of sense, but if we think about it, when we add the yellow and the red, in addition to making it greener and bluer, those two things are going to make this color get darker. And in fact, a color that was on the light side, by adding that yellow and the red, we've made it go away to the dark side, so we have to add some white to bring it back. Okay, Software can do all those calculations for us. Again, an experienced color matcher may be able to do them as well, um, but it's a great tool to have if the colorant mix is the problem. Again, whether it's an ink, a paint, um, pigments, colorants, um, predispersed colorants, dyes, doesn't really matter. Um, when it's about the formula and the recipe, we have the ability to fix that. So that's one thing that we might have to address. But let's assume then that the colorant mix is correct. So how do we focus on process? Well, Got to realize, final color is the culmination of many different variables, right? And each of those variables will contribute to the color that we produce. And we call the total of all those contributions to vari the variable contributions the error stack. And it might look something like this. So 
here we're looking at an air stack of a delta E of what, 1.2, and it's made up. Some part of that is coming from the raw materials, which we might we previously called colorant. Could be other raw materials as well, right? The resin, um, solvents, even vari variations in those things might have an impact on color. Um, temperature, processing, measurement, humidity. Now I've broken it down here. It said my 1.2 delta E is these got these five variables. The reality is that my 1.2 delta E more likely has this many different variables, and I haven't labeled them. I'm just giving us a visual of the fact that there are lots and lots of variables that can contribute to color. Now, there's lots of variables in production. Some of them might have a large impact on color. Some of them might not have any impact on color or very minimal impact on color. But let's assume, again, that we're just going to focus on the process being the cause here. So how do we do that? We do that by tracking the variables within production. And then can we assess their impact on color? So again, here we are back to our pale yellow. Pale yellow standard with multiple samples. We've got some fails, we've got some passes, and we've got one in the margin. So what's the real problem here? So let's take a different look at this exact same data. So in this view, what we get at the bottom is you'll see a trend chart where it's plotting the tolerance the delta E2000 in this case. The green dots pass and the red dots fail. You'll also notice that in the data, we've got three additional columns that I'm now displaying called temperature, production line, and shift. And what we've done in our IQC software, we have the ability to identify and or attach metadata about each sample. So if I've chosen to use three groups in my each Time I take a measurement, I'm identifying a temperature, right? Maybe a temperature about um, at some point in the process. I'm I'm able to gather and record a temperature in in the processing. I'm recording which production line because I have two of them, and I don't want to assume that both machines duplicate things exactly. And I also am tracking which shift. Now I just use those as examples. You could be identifying any number of things you want to track through groups and through tags in the software, you'd be, have the ability to do this. So I've done it by this, and then the beauty of this is, is that I can come in here and click on this column called temperature and actually sort my samples based on temperature. And so I just did that. And so now you can see it starts with the samples that were made at 100 C all the way to 120 C. So I can start now to do some analysis of my process variation. So this one um, was at 100 C. Everything else in a lower temperature had really good color. That one actually failed. Well, it's possible that trial number eight up there, it wasn't a process variation. It was actually a colorant issue that I needed to correct. I can further look at these temperatures and go, okay, well, once I get over 110 C, I have a problem, except Wow, at 120 C, I actually have one of my best samples. It's only a 0.49. So it's not entirely temperature specific, but if we look then over here at the second thing, we can see, oh, if I'm over 110 C on production line number one, my color starts to fail. In fact, as the temperature goes up, the, the delta E increases. That's something I need to go look at. Um, maybe I've got to tighten up my temperature control on line one, and on line two, maybe it's not as critical because I was all the way at 120 C. Um, now, of course, I'm making some assumptions here, and we're thinking that each um, variable acts independently and on its own, which isn't always true. But I think you can start to see how we can use the data if we've labeled it properly to be able to really assess what things might be causing this. And often the best way to actually validate that is to do some forced changes. In other words, run a single batch at multiple temperatures, or a, you know, maybe you can do it in a laboratory setting um, and actually force it to an extreme to see what that does to my color. 
you know, maybe we find that, yes, in fact, as we go up in temperature, it tends to drive things in one direction. Here, that's not necessarily true, right? Dark and light, green and red, blue and yellow, but maybe it's as my temperature goes up, it causes my color to shift this way or that way. So using that data, using that metadata helps us be able to really start to do process control and some understanding of how that impacts us. And of course, the more data we can get, the better we get at this. This isn't something you're going to do on day one in a quality control program. It's something you want to do with not 10 samples like I have, but several hundred samples where you can really start to understand, wow, 80% of the time, if we go over 110 C, we fail on line one. Okay, we've got to make sure we never go over 110 C on line one. We're going to learn those kinds of things. So that's what we're after in controlling process um, or understanding our process and its impact on our color. So to wrap up, three things. One, ensure your tolerance is set in agreement with your customer and your visual assessment because we got to have that right so that we can be sa make sound decisions about correcting when we don't meet our tolerance. Number two, color adjustment or colorant adjustment can be manual based on the colorimetric data in your experience, what you see, what the deltas tell you, and an experienced color matcher, that may be sufficient, or it can also be done using software like iMatch. And the third point is tracking your production variables is key to understanding the root cause of repeated color issues. It's not gonna solve everything, right because there's so many different variables but it can start to help you identify those root causes of the most common reasons why your color fails so that concludes this webinar um, we as robert said we will leave things open for a moment for you if you have questions please use the questions panel to go ahead and ask those i will leave this slide up here as we do that and i thank you all very much for your time today